the first thing I wanted to think about in, in giving this talk and in working on this kind of material with students is what kinds of historical questions are raised by thinking about turning points. I, I find this a really fascinating concept just in the examination interpretation of history. Um, turning points are the kind of thing that um, sometimes we think are easy to see in hindsight uh, sometimes people think they see them at the time, and often in both cases, we're wrong. Um, and it's it also sometimes the question of turning points raises questions that um, make us think about inevitability in history, uh, whether things had to turn out one way or another, um, or counterfactuals in history. If some factor had changed, how might things have gone differently? Um, and I guess ultimately, I like thinking about turning points maybe instead of counterfactuals for too long, because it helps us to kind of assess what did happen rather than what might have happened. Um, though maybe it does allow us to maybe see how those two things relate to one another. And that's the kind of question that people often ask about military history and about the US Civil War, like what might have gone differently. So thinking about turning points is a great way to engage students with that kind of thinking while still focusing on what actually happened and, and the facts and uh, thinking about uh, truthful stories about the, the US Civil War. Um, I, this was part of my invitation, but I was glad the turning points notice that's plural. Um, I think it would be very, very difficult to ever find just one turning point of something as complex as the US Civil War, and we wouldn't really try to do that. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at three main turning points today. Um, and we're gonna, we can think about what kinds of historical questions are raised um, and what kinds of turning points these are in the Civil War, because we're gonna see that um, all three of these in some ways connect a lot of different aspects of the Civil War. Uh, you know, uh, I know you talked about the war's causes, but the social history of the US Civil War, the causes of the US Civil War, the military progress, and then um, even pointing towards the outcome of the war. Um, yeah, excuse me for one second, I'm about to sneeze. Anyway, hopefully not. Anyway, so the turning points of the Civil War that we're gonna focus on today all happened in 1863. So uh, I thought before we actually talk about the turning points, we just need to kind of sketch out slightly what was the situation um, by late 1862. I mean, you all know that the Civil War started in April of 1861, um, and it had kind of seesawed a little bit in advantage through the first couple of years of the war. By late 1862, there were several really important developments. So um, Robert E. Lee's first offensive campaign into the North, into United States territory, had been pushed back. Um, and that had, of course, resulted, not the pushback, but the campaign had resulted at, in the Battle of Antietam in September, which um, was then um, was a defeat, and Lee was pushed back out of Union territory. Um, that Union victory um, allowed Abraham Lincoln to issue what became known as the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation um, in September of um, 1862, just a few days after the Battle of Antietam. Um, Lincoln told his cabinet I, that he intended to um, sign an Emancipation Proclamation and change uh, the ending of slavery into a war aim, something we're going to talk more about here in a minute. Um, we also see um, by the end of 1862, by December of 1862, the war in the West had been very, very important. And Ulysses S. Grant, um, Union General, um, begins a very difficult campaign against Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, we're gonna talk more about that as well. So it was the whole campaign was just beginning in, at the end of 1862. And also at the end of 1862, two major battles, Battle of Fredericksburg and the Battle of Chancellorsville went quite poorly for the United States. And so um, Abraham Lincoln and the Northern public are feeling war weary and feeling concerned about the fates of the United States. So even though um, Lee's first invasion of the North had been thwarted, um, it, it looked like maybe things weren't going to go so well in 1863. So that kind of sets up the year of 1863. Some more things happen at the beginning of 1863, but um, this gives us enough to kind of think about where the turning points come. So it's not really clear which side has the overall advantage. Um, it's not clear who's gonna win the US Civil War. Nobody knew that at the end of 1862. Um, and so the question arises, 
what is going to cause um, one side or the other to have an advantage in 1863. Um, now, in hindsight, we know that 1863 is a pivotal, the pivotal year of the war. And so there's a question of like, what's going to change in 1863? Um, and so that is going to be where we're going to see the turning points of the Civil War. The first turning point of the Civil War we're going to talk about is emancipation. And you can see that here. This is a, I love this image of Thomas Nast uh, drawing, um, is sort of personifying emancipation. Um, on the left, it has um, the kind of horrors of the system of slavery. On the right, you see things like um, formerly enslaved people collecting wages and going to school. And in the middle, you see this sort of nuclear family. Um, and there are different versions of this, but most of them have the bust of Abraham Lincoln there. So emancipation as a, a great dawn in 1863. So, it and even though lots and lots and lots of people, I mean, there are almost no historians now or approaching zero who would say emancipation, I mean, emancipation is super important to the Civil War in all kinds of ways, but it, I think is underappreciated sometimes as an actual turning point of the war, that it had military significance alongside social and cultural significance. So that's, we're gonna kind of see how those are all intertwined. Um, and so um, we'll look at a number of ways in which that emancipation is the first, first turning point we're gonna talk about. Um, so Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation um, effective January 1st, 1863, kind of opens the year of 1863. Um, it's also probably the timing is one of the reasons we can claim that 1863 is, is this big turning point year. Um, it's really important that it is in fact an executive action and it's that that ties um, the Emancipation Proclamation to the military importance um, and as a military turning point because the Emancipation Proclamation um, itself as a document, which I hope is something you're able to use with students. It's a great document to have students look at. It's not so complex, though it, 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 is, it repays careful reading. Um, Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation in his capacity as commander in chief of the US Armed Forces. Um, and that is why it only applies to areas of the country that are in rebellion. Um, and it even names specific counties within states that the United States has retaken um, because he, he is using war powers against rebellious states to emancipate um, their slaves. And it's a little bit paradoxical, right? Because you ask yourself, uh, those states didn't recognize the authority of the US president. Yes, that's true. But it was a very, very large use of executive power and extremely significant. Um, only a few other times, probably eclipsed only by um, Haiti up to that point where uh, people emancipated themselves by overthrowing um, the government and the colonial power and having a revolution. Um, it freed the most people with the strike of a pen, um, even if they had to actually enforce their freedom um, through winning the war even after that. So um, emancipation was a demonstration of the war powers of the US president. Um, and it's extremely important in understanding um, Lincoln's role as chief executive. And the fact that he chose to use that power as chief executive to emancipate slaves. Now, the limited nature of it makes us remember why the 13th Amendment is still necessary, because in order to get rid of the entire institution of slavery everywhere um, after the war and in US territory, um, it takes an amendment to the US Constitution to do that. Um, emancipation um, is extremely important. And after the Emancipation Proclamation, um, the getting rid of the institution of slavery becomes an explicit aim of the US Civil War. Now, I know you all have talked about this. Of course, um, slavery, the expansion of slavery, controversies over the institution of slavery, and the mistreatment of enslaved people um, all were the causes of the US Civil War. They had a huge impact on economics and politics and everything else that caused secession and the war to start. But that's not the same thing as saying that the US military was fighting the war with the aim of getting rid of slavery, right? Because even up until late 1862, uh, or early 1862, Abraham Lincoln was still saying that he favored gradual abolition and there were different schemes to compensate the owners, et cetera, et cetera. It became clear through the beginning of the US Civil War that 
uh, Lincoln and his allies had to take the leap and make the war about slavery, not just caused by slavery, but fought in order to get rid of the institution of slavery and to protect enslaved people because hundreds of thousands of enslaved people, tens of thousands had been escaping had been seeking refuge in Union lines from the very beginning of the war. Um, and so with the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863, the US war goal, one of the goals, in addition to restoring the Union, which had been the original goal, overall goal, one of the goals becomes to eradicate the institution of slavery. It's a massive expansion of the goal of the war, and it ties the eradication of the institution of slavery to the restoration of the union. They're gonna be hand in hand after that. That's the kind of thing that makes a real turning point, right? If you change the aim of the war, it's definitely gonna be important. Now, emancipation itself as an experience, as a political reality, as a cultural reality is of course shaped by African-Americans all over the United States and in the Confederacy. Um, and they, shape the meaning of freedom and even the reality of freedom by um, running away, by moving, by um, helping the Union Army, by uh, trying to find their children, et cetera, et cetera. And it's gonna have to be tested on a daily, daily basis. And you know, it, it prolongs from 1863 through to the end of the war and beyond in 1865, acts by individual African-American people um, shaping the meaning of emancipation for themselves and getting involved in the politics of emancipation. And then this photograph, which I love, this is um, a, a carte de visite photograph in front of a, a backdrop at actually a military camp, um, also shows us one of the biggest ways that Black people um, shaped emancipation and also the war aims for themselves. And that was by joining the US military. Because the other thing that, one of the other things, one of the main things the Emancipation Proclamation said was, not only are slaves in rebellious uh, territory uh, emancipated, but also the Union military forces are open to black enlistment. So this is extremely important. The Emancipation Proclamation changed the character of the US military forces. Now, that's not to say in previous wars, if you ask Denver Brunsman, right? Uh, the War of 1812, the Revolutionary War, of course, black men had fought in those wars, but they had been prohibited from enlisting in the US Army and in the Navy, um, though more black men fought informally in the Navy, they had been prohibited from enlisting in the US Civil War until January 1st of 1863. And it's extremely significant to the war when they are allowed to do so. Um, there were 180,000 black men in the Union Army. It was 10% of the US Army and about 19,000 in the Navy. This is, um, this is a sailor, black sailor, this picture, this photograph. Um, and that is extremely important because the the army needed those men and those men gained a lot from the army and the Navy. Um, and we're gonna see some political effects of that after the war. We'll see that in one of our documents for today. So emancipation is extremely important to the civil war, um, has a lot of consequences. And the Civil War is extremely important for the way that African Americans will shape the freedom experience after the war as well. And it's certainly a turning point um, in 1863. The second turning point we're gonna talk about might be a little bit more expected, um, a battle, the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, the largest battle of the US Civil War, extremely, extremely important battle. I probably don't, there's almost no one in the United States, certainly anyone who was educated in the United States, who hasn't heard of the Battle of Gettysburg. It's extremely important in our national consciousness. Um, and it's extremely, extremely important. And it's a big turning point in the US Civil War. Um, happens uh, July 2nd through 4th, uh, 1863. Uh, the first reason that we would call Gettysburg a turning point is the scale of the battle. Um, it's just an absolutely enormous battle. 50,000 men were engaged in the battle, plus probably some extras. Um, it was this three-day battle. As I said, it was the site of the largest artillery battle, for instance, in the Western Hemisphere um, ever at 
in this battle. And that's just one little part of the Battle of Gettysburg is this artillery battle. It has all kinds of other smaller engagements, um, including infantry, cavalry, and artillery. Um, the scale is really, really massive. Lots and lots of men are engaged and it has extremely high casualties. So that's gonna be very, very important for the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, Another reason that Gettysburg is a turning point in the US Civil War, um, sometimes it's thought of this, there's kind of an ancillary question, um, whether Gettysburg is actually what's called the high watermark of the Confederacy. This is a picture of Robert E. Lee. Um, and the question of the high watermark is, so the Confederacy rose this high, and then it kind of falls from there. Um, and is Gettysburg is sometimes called that high watermark. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but it's certainly a turning point um, in Confederate fates and in Confederate strategy. Gettysburg is comes about, of course, because of Lee's second invasion of Union territory, his offensive campaign into Union territory, and he lost the battle. He failed. And so he was, again, had to retreat out of Union territory. And this is one of those places where counterfactuals might come in. If Lee had won, what might have happened? Like he might have pushed further into Union territory, other kinds of, I mean, really many things could have gone differently. So um, that is true. It also is maybe a high watermark because Lee was seen as such a genius. He was so creative. He was so effective as a commanding general. Um, and he made big mistakes probably at Gettysburg. That's still debated. Um, but most military historians would say he made some mistakes, some key mistakes, especially engaging in Pickett's charge on the third day at Gettysburg. Um, again, that's very debated, but a lot of, a lot of folks would point to that. So it, it's a turning point in Lee's kind of invincibility and infallibility as a commanding general. Um, it's very important. Now that's then painted by the, by the post-Confederates as kind of a part of the lost cause, the kind of doomed heroicism of the Confederacy. But it is a point, a pivot point for the military history. Um, the Battle of Gettysburg ultimately had a big effect on morale, especially Union morale, obviously, and in convincing the Northern public to continue supporting the war. So for instance, um, one of the things that happens again during the very same week are the draft riots in New York City, lots of other draft riots going elsewhere. There are lots of people within the North who don't support the war, but the, the effective victory at the Battle of Gettysburg um, allows their voices to be muted and for a rallying point for the Union public um, around the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, it also gives, it's interesting because in the first few days after the battle, I don't, it's not entirely clear to everyone involved that it was such a huge Union victory. You might be surprised, especially because um, Meade was cautious, the US was cautious and didn't plunge forward and didn't follow Lee and sort of like give his, they didn't break his army entirely. They just pushed him out of Pennsylvania. Um, and so at first they were a little bit unsure, but as things continued, it became clear also when it's layered with our next turning point, um, as things continued, the, um, the morale piece of Gettysburg becomes extremely important. Okay, so the third turning point that I would point to is the Battle of Vicksburg. Vicksburg, Mississippi, um, you see here a courier and Ives. Uh, drawing from the Union perspective um, of the siege of Vicksburg. And that's Vicksburg. You can really see really well in this, this picture why Vicksburg was called the Gibraltar of the South, uh, because it's this extremely high point um, on bluffs on the Mississippi River, um, and it's really, really important. Um, Vicksburg, many, many hist military historians would argue, is arguably of greater military importance than Gettysburg um, in turning the war to the favor of the Union. Excuse me, that's controversial and military historians argue about it. it some of it has to do with the, the value of Eastern campaigns versus Western campaigns. Um, some of it has to do, is all tied up in public memory as we'll talk about in a minute, but, um, but Vicksburg um, is extremely important. Uh, the whole campaign around Vicksburg, which started in December of 1862, as I said, um, it becomes um, a huge success, especially for commanding general Ulysses S. Grant. Um, 
in any way that you measure this, um, Lincoln had called Gettys had called Vicksburg, excuse me, the key to the Confederacy. Um, he saw it as the key to turning the tide of the war, and he was probably correct. Um, with um, only ten thousand men um, in the final in the final campaign for part of the campaign, the siege of Vicksburg, um, there Grant managed to kill ten thousand Confederate soldiers. Um, wound 10,000 Confederate soldiers and capture 37,000 Confederate soldiers, including five generals. And really they're in the whole campaign, it's a whole series of battles, um, but the, the, the ultimate surrender of the city of Vicksburg is extremely important as a turning point. So this, uh, the whole scale of the campaign, the effectiveness of Grant's strategy and the actual capture of the city of Vicksburg are what gonna make it a big turning point. Um, capturing the city is important basically because of supply lines. Um, the um, Vicksburg, uh, Jefferson Davis on the other side of Lincoln had called Vicksburg um, the nail head that connects the two halves of the South, of the Confederacy. Um, and that's because um, the Union Army and Navy had, had put pressure on the Confederacy, had blockaded um, internal and um, external waterways, and had captured almost all of the Mississippi River, um, had captured New Orleans, had captured much of the Mississippi River north of Vicksburg, but did not control the Mississippi River around Vicksburg. And so that allowed um, the Western Confederate States to supply the Eastern Confederate States through the rail lines that connected in Vicksburg. So they had a control of a part of the Mississippi, key strategic part. So things like beef from Texas could go to feed the Eastern part of the Confederacy because it could travel through Vicksburg. Um, the same is true for lead and Louisiana sugar and other, other really key products. Um, and so the strategic point of Vicksburg and its like bluff quality up on that hill make it um, hard to capture and really, really important for Confederate strategy. Um, the other thing that we see coming out of the, the the surrender of Vicksburg on July 4th of 1863 um, is a greater emphasis on total war. That emphasis had been ratcheting up uh, through 1862, but it really starts here in 1863 and it goes forward with a vengeance after this point. The siege of Vicksburg, um, it was a month long siege. Uh, Vicksburg was extremely well fortified and the um, Union Army entrenched all around the fortifications and basically starved the city of Vicksburg, starved the civilian population even worse than the military, uh, Confederate military involved, um, including enslaved people who were in Vicksburg and the entire civilian Confederate population in Vicksburg, um, cut off the food supply, and it was a real trench warfare the precursor of even something like World War I, where you see like long periods of, of trench warfare and civilian populations suffering very heavily. Um, but what is learned from this on the Union side is that that may be what it takes to bring the war to a close, or at least it's, a, it's gonna be an effective uh, strategy, especially when applied carefully. Um, that's again, another controversial question. Um, it, it, it showed the military value of involving uh, the civilian population. Jefferson Davis said, we are now in the darkest hour of our political existence when he heard that Vicksburg had been surrendered. Um, the, the last thing I'll say about Vicksburg here is part of that learning about total war, uh, Vicksburg is a big success for Commanding General Ulysses S. Grant and um, showing the value of total war. And what happens is Lincoln is able to put more sort of trust in Grant. Also Sherman had been involved in the in some of the uh, campaigns or some of the battles within the campaign around Vicksburg. And Grant takes the lessons he learns from the siege of Vicksburg and applies them to the next set of campaigns and to Sherman's campaigns in the Carolinas and Georgia. It also cuts off a lot of the action in the West and refocuses the action in the East. And so it puts Ulysses S. Grant in the position of um, being the commanding, he gets actually into being the commanding general of the Union forces um, and it's gonna set up the whole last part of the US Civil War. So definitely a turning point, no matter which way you look at it. So 
where does that leave us in the last few minutes? Um, just to kind of take a step back from the specifics. So we could say emancipation, Gettysburg and Vicksburg. Those are the three turning points I focused on for 1863. Um, what changed? How is turning towards what? So after July of 1863, really the advantage shifted to the United States away from the Confederacy. That does not mean that Union victory was inevitable. In fact, the Civil War was only a little bit more than half over in July of 1863. Um, it does not mean that the Union had to win, but it does mean that they started to take steps that helped to lead to them winning. That's what actually happened. Um, and the turning points allowed long-term Union advantages to be mobilized. Advantages like um, the ability to enroll Black men in the military, the long-term advantages of population size, manufacturing, munitions, et cetera, um, gaining the advantage helped that. Um, and the war itself was very different after these turning points, um, not the least of which because of emancipation. To think a little bit about, um, you know, some of you may have different ideas and things that you knew already about this, but um, in general, I would say Gettysburg eclipses Vicksburg in public memory. It's not necessarily only because of the battle, maybe because of its size, but also because of the military cemetery, right, that is built there, um, and because of the Gettysburg Address, and because of, um, it's kind of a chicken and an egg, a lot of the commemorative efforts, maybe because it's more of an Eastern state, maybe because it's in Union territory. Uh, but Gettysburg is usually the first thing people will think of. Um, as I said before, emancipation is very important in public memory. Lots of people remember emancipation, but the military significance of it is often underplayed. And by thinking about all these things, I think it's also a great way to get our students to think about the larger um, historical questions. What, what does it mean to say something is a turning point? What might have happened if something had gone differently? Um, how can we know whether something is inevitable or not in the past? Um, so that is most of the actual content I wanted to tell you, but I just want to point out a few things. Um, and again, you're going to have access to this presentation. Um, all of the illustrations that I used in these slides are actually um, publicly available and they're open access from the Library of Congress. Um, and I included a link here. I'm sure some of you use it already, but the Library of Congress prints and photographs catalog has very many images that you can just directly download that are free of copyright and able to be used. And that's what I did for this presentation to kind of show you how that worked. Um, and this is a link to that, um, a link to the National Museum of American History, um, a, a, an online exhibit about Black military service in the Civil War. And then these are two um, so-called animated maps that I would recommend. These are great to use with students. Um, you might have to think about age appropriateness, but I would say high school at least, um, from the American Battlefield Trust, um, Gettysburg and Vicksburg, and they call them animated maps, but they're really short little documentaries that have battle maps um, in them. They're both freely available um, on YouTube, um, but they're couched here. I gave you the link to the larger American Battlefield Trust website about that. Um, okay, so I think I will stop there.